in undertaking to describe the recent and strange incidents in our town, till lately wrapped in uneventful obscurity, I find myself forced, in absence of literary skill, to begin my story rather far back, that is to say with certain biographical details, concerning the talented and highly esteemed gentleman, Stepan Trofimovich Verkhovinsky. I trust that these details may at least serve as an introduction, while my projected story itself will come later. I will say at once that Stepan Trofimovich had always filled a particular role among us, that of the progressive patriot, so to say, and he was passionately fond of playing the part, so much so that I really believe he couldn't have existed without it. Not that I would put him on a level with an actor in the theater, God forbid, for I really have a respect for him. This may all have been the effect of habit, or rather, more exactly, of a generous propensity he had from his earliest years for indulging in an agreeable daydream in which he figured as a picturesque public character. He fondly loved, for instance, his position as a persecuted man, so to speak, an exile. There is a sort of traditional glamour about those two little words that fascinated him once for all and, exalting him gradually in his own opinion, raised him in the course of years to a lofty pedestal very gratifying to vanity. In an English satire of the last century, Gulliver, returning from the land of the Lilliputians where people were only three or four inches high, had grown so accustomed to consider himself a giant among them, that as he walked along the streets of London he couldn't help crying out to carriages and passers-by to be careful and get out of his way for fear he should crush them, imagining that they were little and he was still a giant. He was laughed at and abused for it, and rough coachmen even lashed at the giant with their whips. But was that just? What may not be done by habit? Habit had brought Stepan Trofimovich almost to the same position, but in a more innocent and inoffensive form, if one may use such expressions, for he was a most excellent man. I am even inclined to suppose that Towards the end he had been entirely forgotten everywhere, but still it cannot be said that his name had never been known. It is beyond question that he had at one time belonged to a certain distinguished constellation of celebrated leaders of the last generation, and at one time, though only for the briefest moment, his name was pronounced by many hasty persons of that day almost as though it were on a level with the names of Chadai or Bielinsky or Granovsky and of Herzen, who had only just begun to write abroad. But Stepan Trofimovich's activity ceased almost at the moment it began, owing, so to say, to a vortex of combined circumstances. And would you believe this? It turned out afterwards that there had been no vortex and even no circumstances, at least in that connection. I only learned the other day to my intense amazement, though on the most unimpeachable authority, that Stepan Trofimovich had lived among us in our province not as an exile as we were accustomed to believe, and had never even been under police supervision at all. Such is the force of the imagination. All his life he sincerely believed that in certain fears, he was a constant cause of apprehension, that every step he took was watched and noted, and that each one of the three governors who succeeded one another during twenty years in our province came with special and uneasy ideas concerning him, which had, by higher powers, been impressed upon each before everything else, when receiving the appointment. Had anyone assured the honest man on the most irrefutable grounds that he had nothing to be afraid of, he would certainly have been offended. Yet Stepan Trofimovich was a most intelligent and gifted man, even so the same man of science, though indeed in science, well, in fact he had not done such great things in science. I believe indeed he had done nothing at all, but that is very often the case, of course, with men of science among us in Russia. 
He came back from abroad, he was brilliant in the capacity of lecturer at the university towards the end of the 40s. He only had time to deliver a few lectures, I believe they were about the Arabs. He maintained two brilliant theses on the political and Hanseatic importance of the German town Hanau, of which there was promise in the epoch between 1413 and 1428 and on the special and obscure reasons why that promise was never fulfilled. This dissertation was a cruel and skillful thrust at the Slava fields of the day, and at once made him numerous and irreconcilable enemies among them. Later on, after he had lost his post as lecturer, however, he published by way of revenge, so to say, and to show them what a man they had lost, in the Progressive Monthly Review, which translated Dickens and advocated the views of George Sand, the beginnings of a very profound investigation into the causes, I believe, of the extraordinary moral nobility of certain knights at a certain epoch or something of that nature. Some lofty and exceptionally noble idea was maintained in it anyway. It was said afterwards that the continuation was hurriedly forbidden, and even that the progressive review had to suffer for having printed the first part. That may very well have been so, for what wasn't possible in those days, though in this case it's more likely that there was nothing of the kind and that the author himself was too lazy to conclude his essay. He cut short his lectures on the Arabs because somehow and by someone, probably one of his reactionary enemies, a letter had been seized given an account of certain circumstances, in consequence of which someone had demanded an explanation from him. I don't know whether the story is true, but it was asserted that at the same time there was discovered in Petersburg a vast, unnatural and illegal conspiracy of 30 people which almost shook society to its foundations. It was said that they were positively on the point of translating Fourier, Although of design a poem of Stepan Trofimovich's was seized in Moscow at that very time, though it had been written six years before in Berlin in his earliest youth, and manuscript copies had been passed round a circle consisting of two poetical amateurs and one student. This poem is lying now on my table. No longer ago than last year, I received a recent copy in his own handwriting, from Stepan Trofimovich himself, signed by him and bound in a splendid red leather binding. It is not without poetic merit, however, and even a certain talent. It is strange, but in those days, or to be more exact, in the thirties, people were constantly composing in that style. I find it difficult to describe the subject, for I really do not understand it. It is some sort of allegory in lyrical dramatic form, recording the second part of Faust. The scene opens with a chorus of women, followed by a chorus of men, then a chorus of incorporeal powers of some sort, and at the end of all a chorus of spirits, not yet living but very eager to come to life. All these choruses sing about something very indefinite, for the most part about somebody's curse, but with a tinge of the higher humor. But the scene is suddenly changed. There begins a sort of festival of life, at which even insects sing. Tortoise comes on the scene with certain sacramental Latin words, and even, if I remember all right, a mineral sings about something that is quite an inanimate object. In fact, they all sing continually, or if they converse, simply to abuse one another vaguely, but again with a tinge of higher meaning. At last the scene is changed again, wilderness appears, and among the rocks there wanders a civilized young man who picks and sucks certain herbs. Asked by a fairy why he sucks these herbs, he answers that, conscious of a superfluity of life in himself, he seeks forgetfulness, and finds it in the juice of these herbs, but that his great desire is to lose his reason at once, a desire possibly superfluous. Then a use of an indescribable beauty rides in on a black steed, 
and an immense multitude of all nations follow him. The youth represents death, for whom all the people are yearning. And finally, in the last scene, we are suddenly shown the Tower of Babel, and third and eighth leads at last finish building it with the throne of new hope, and when at length they complete the topmost pinnacle, the Lord of Olympia, let us say, takes flight in a comic fashion, and man, grasping the situation and seizing his place, at once begins a new life with new insight into things. Well, this poem was thought at that time to be dangerous. Last year I proposed to Stepan Trofimovich to publish it, on the ground of its perfect harmlessness nowadays, but he declined the suggestion with evident dissatisfaction. My view of its complete harmlessness evidently displeased him, and I even ascribed it to a certain coldness on his part, which lasted a whole month. And what do you think? Suddenly, almost at the time I proposed printing it here, our poem was published abroad in a collection of revolutionary verse, without the knowledge of Stepan Trofimovich. He was at first alarmed, rushed to the governor, and brought a noble letter in self-defense to Petersburg. He read it to me twice, but didn't send it, not knowing to whom to address it. In fact, he was in a state of agitation for a whole month, but I am convinced that in the secret recesses of his heart he was enormously flattered. He almost took the copy of the collection to bed with him and kept it hidden under his mattress in the daytime. He positively would not allow the woman to turn his bed, and although he expected every day a telegram, he held his head high. No telegram came. Then he made friends with me again, which is a proof of the extreme kindness of his gentle and unresentful heart. 